I am speaking. This is not my voice. This image is not me. Altogether, I am here to ask, can you trust me? Hi, uh, my name is Richard Ramchurn. I'm an artist and a researcher um, based at the University of Nottingham. Um, I make um, interactive and adaptive um, content, story content, sometimes movies, sometimes VR. Um, our, our main main idea is is to create create avatars that are in some way created with AI, uh, and to really challenge the audience um, to uh, explore what part of that, um, of what part of what they're looking at is created by AI, what's created by humans. Um, we're making a, a series of like talking heads. And some of the voices will be sim simulated. Some of them will be from the person that are seeing. Some from that we're, we're swapping voices. We're using AI-generated voices. Uh, but then the actual text that is being s spoken, yeah. some of that is AI-generated. Some of it's written for um, the, the other person. So you're not exactly sure where the where the the message is coming from, and then what the medium of that message is. As I write, I do not know who listens. You, the listener, are you human? And should I trust you? My name's Rachel Jacobs. Um, I'm an artist. Um, I'm also a researcher. In this image, you can see Future Machine, uh, which is an interactive device. It's deliberately very slow quite difficult to use, quite complicated, but deliberately. But for me, that engenders trust. It helps build relationships and familiarity because it's flawed and it's, and it's cumbersome. This is an object that appears in five different places around the country at the same time every year. It captures data and messages for the future and weather data and uh, webcam images from each of these places when it appears and plays them back. It's a kind of container and a witness to these places and how people feel about these places now and how they feel about the future. So it kind of speculates into the future um, what, what we think might happen and our hopes and dreams around that. People can talk into this small trumpet on the side of, of the future machine and kind of whisper or confess a message for the future through the future machine. So it prints out um, little messages <laughs> that tell you kind of news from the planet. There's dials embedded in the machine that people can turn and wherever they turn them to changes how these, how these news from the planet appear. So it's telling you about what's happening now and then invites you to leave a message for the future. We've had a lot of quite emotional things that people have left. They talk about it as if it's their right. future machine. And because it returns every year, some of the participants in the project return every year as well to meet it. So you're building up a kind of relationship, a kind of kinship between this funny, wobbly, wooden metal device and the people that, that live in a place and feel ownership about the place and their community. So it, it, we're asking a lot of this device. It's a container of our hopes and dreams, but we have to trust it in order to give, leave our hopes and dreams with it. I've had many people saying, I love the future machine. I love it when it comes to our place. Uh, I'm Ali Hosseini. I'm a visiting senior research fellow in the Department of Engineering at King's College London. Let me talk about Groupthink. That was the name of the uh, the piece. This was um, a collaborative art piece that was part performance and part installation and part generative software. We developed custom software based on open source uh, material for doing what's called a remote hemodynamic monitoring, which is just... Uh, a very precise way of saying we're looking at people's um, foreheads, looking at the change of color and using algorithms, specifically Eulerian video magnification to judge these changes and infer heartbeat from that. Read it into a table and feed it back into 
this production system. And the production system <laughs> consisted of two live musicians, very talented, um, a sitarist and a guitarist. And they were playing in an immersive video environment in on the National Gallery campus in the National Gallery X facility. And those immersive videos were AI generated artworks that used a combination of scans of the National Gallery paintings and my own art, all having to do with trees and organic forms. So groupthink was about what happens when you let loose a group of people participating in a, a collective cultural activity with uh, other humans uh, who have agency and also machines that have a kind of quasi agency because the machines yeah. are creating the artworks in groupthink. It's also very illustrative of how people can just dive into a system and give up a, a great deal of information about themselves um, just for an entertainment experience. But in this case, it was musical entertainment, but you could take the same and do, you know, you could do a war scenario or marketing strategy for a company. The, the scenarios actually are quite portable if you abstract from the situation and get a schema that can then be applied elsewhere. That's why yeah. I think it's relevant to the use case library, because this use case can be generalized into medicine, military, uh, you know, commercial settings. The design we, we're proposing really is called Close Encounters. So this would be a robotic arm, and we'd like to kind of embed AI as a kind of central feature to it. You see, so he's called Ned, our never-ending dancer. So he's always trying to dance, so you really have to catch his attention. Because initially, as people meet Ned, that's when he wakes up and some music starts playing and the engagement begins. One of the things that we'd done initially was to dress the robot. So we'd created a costume for it. And this is something that we really want to develop. And we think this is something that really enables and engages with that trust. Um, for audiences to to see more of a, a kind of anthropomorphic character than just the robotic arm. So in this picture, the children had just appeared, saw the robot, realized that they could the robot will wake up and start interacting with them, and then they started moving and dancing, and that was sort of almost instant. There is a kind of question how you approach and the aesthetics of a piece whether that affects um, trust. Sometimes as human beings, we approach a person and we almost make, um, we make assumptions or we, we kind of decide on whether we could trust yeah. a person sometimes instantly when we look at them. I don't know if, if a robot is costumed, whether that is the same thing. When children followed the robot or the robot followed the children, they really liked following the robot um, or, the, or that yeah. the robot followed them. They recognized that uh, that was um, happening and so having this new this new model we're not sure if it will affect trust in any way in terms of if um, if the system is not only following them but the system is thinking for itself. We were at the Green Hustle Festival in Nottingham a couple of weeks ago and mostly adults came more than children. It was interesting to see how they engaged in play because play helps with a sense of fun, sense of relaxation, um, brings a smile on people's faces, curiosity, that sense that um, people just suddenly see something quite novel and they begin to explore it. And, and through that exploration, understanding it, there's a kind of sense of trust building up as well. You know, a family came in when we had it at Lakeside Arts and there was children, there was their parents, and there was their grandparents. And the whole group danced with Ned. And it just, you know, it's just so exciting, I think. It's, you know, it doesn't get much better than that for me. <laughs> you know, I think it would be a brilliant resource. A use case library is vital because we can abstract schema or schemata from uh, other use cases. 
some of these things, I mean, for one thing, it's useful to find one that just applies to your situation. So yeah. clearly you want as many as possible yeah. so that there's a, a good fit. I, the other comment I want to make about a use case library is I think we've developed a lot of fundamental science, which then turns into, uh, becomes in, operationalized and instrumentalized and then deployed. Yeah. And we haven't really tested this enough. And now that we live in the Anthropocene, and essentially live in a technosphere uh, as much as an ecosphere, we need to start testing things early. And th these use cases can inform uh, future development, they can inform regulation, and they can inform standards, and they can also inform um, post-deployment fixes in case things, unanticipated problems start to come out. That's why you need use cases, to, so people can jump out and cut across and look at the implications of what they're doing in an abbreviated way. Uh, without, We're not going to think through everything ourselves as we work on a great application. So the use case library can be a place where you could just put in some keywords and say, oh, I hadn't thought about that unintended effect or un possible unintended effect. I'm really interested in getting involved with this use case library because I feel from my experience of working in HCI since 2005, yeah. really, it's collaborating with the Mixed Reality Lab, um, that there's there's a real need for different perspectives and artists can bring that in, particularly when you're working with different communities and different sectors of society, different places, different regions. Yeah, I mean, it's, I'm, I mean, the use cases kind of you read like black mirror episodes don't they it's always, it's always like um uh you're arrested by a robot like uh, do you yeah. do you comply do you know what I mean it's, it's it's they're all like interesting concepts uh which each one you could run with and place a narrative on and, and explore in more ways than just uh yeah i would i would comply or i wouldn't comply as an answer and i think that's like the, the kind of boon of um creating artwork as a as a research tool is is all, all at least like this multifaceted ideas that people can bounce off respond to and that it's it's about responding to and it's about uh reacting to in a almost like an emotional way because it's about exploring how you feel about it I would say, think about what's going to happen when your research gets deployed. And uh, think about the best thing that can happen and think about the worst thing that can happen. And you've got two use cases right there.